be forgiven for thinking that Psalm 93 has nothing to do with you. Because if you had it open, which would be helpful to you this morning, you would find, looking through it, I don't know if you noticed this when we read it together, you'll find there are apparently no people whatsoever in this psalm. There's God, and there's creation, and there's mighty waters and waves and seas, and there's firm statutes, and there's God's house, and there's endless days. But the psalmist never mentions himself, like he has done, for example, in the previous psalm, 92. He says, verse 4 of that psalm, You make me glad by your deeds, O Lord. He doesn't do that in Psalm 93. He doesn't talk about himself. And nor does he talk about anyone else. Like he does in the next psalm, Psalm 94. Where he says, Rise up, judge of the earth. Pay back to the proud what they deserve. So he's got people in mind there, Psalm 94. He's got people in mind uh, in Psalm 92. But in Psalm 93, there aren't any people anywhere to be seen. Any sort of application to everyday life seems to be pretty much absent. And yet, as you probably guess, I was going to say, if you were to really think that this psalm has nothing to do with you, of course you'd be completely wrong. Because here it is in God's words, spoken, written for us. I once uh, heard the story of a couple who went to the church where the well-known preacher John Piper was the pastor. And this couple had gone there on a Sunday after they'd just gone through a very great tragedy in their lives. I can't quite remember exactly what the nature of the tragedy was. I think it was something to do with a death in their family, possibly the death of a child. And on that particular Sunday, John Piper was preaching on that, that great, awesome passage in Isaiah chapter 6. You know where Isaiah has this vision of the Lord in his temple and there's an earthquake and the foundations of the temple shake and it's filled with smoke and the angels cry holy, holy, holy and on that day when John Piper was preaching on that passage and this couple were there John Piper, whether deliberately or not he didn't make any application to people's lives whatsoever he didn't say and this is what this means for your life today he kind of just left it with this vision of God. He just preached the majesty of the living Lord. Now, that was that Sunday. Months later, uh, he found out that this couple had been there. It's a very large church, so maybe he didn't realise. This couple had been there, and, and they'd just been through that great tragedy on that day. And he remembered that in that sermon, he'd had nothing specific in terms of um, how to apply this to your life in his message and that bothered him that concerned him and he could see then that they were people who would have needed particular help and counsel as to how to live and react at a time like that how to trust God and so he he, he found out where they lived and he went to see them and he went to ask how they were doing and what they said to him was this they said pastor the vision of God's majesty that you gave us on that day is the one thing that we have been able to hold on to for all these months of sorrow. We would not have got through without it. You see, in that sense, they didn't need any application. This is how to apply this to your life. They just needed to see how great God is. How God is completely sovereign. Whatever comes, he is in control. We just need to get hold of that. Now, of course, neither John Piper nor I, nor any preacher worth their salt, would say that as a general rule, there's never any need for preachers to apply the truth of Bible passages like Psalm 93 or Isaiah 6 to people's lives, to your lives. Of course, that is necessary week in, week out. Um, that's part of the job of preaching. But still, I tell that story to impress on you that sometimes the truth of God's majestic sovereignty is itself the application. In and of itself, 
We learn to trust a holy and mighty God and say, whatever happens, it's all in his hands. So do not, I'm doing application now, just so you know, <laughs> do not now then try and get through life in this world without getting a hold on this enormous truth, the utter, utter sovereignty of God in every single detail of life, huge and tiny. Don't try and get through life without getting a hold of that, or rather without letting that truth get a hold of you. Because that will keep you and sustain you and ground you and give you calm in the storm or whatever you are facing. So let's try and have it grip us this morning from Psalm 93 in, in three particular ways. So the first thing I'd, I'd like you to see from this psalm is this. God's sovereignty makes the world stable. God's sovereignty, his rule over everything without exception, makes the world stable. Now as we've been starting out on this journey through book four of the psalms, we've been seeing, well I've been trying to um, help you uh, see the kind of theme which largely runs through this book more or less, and it's the theme that the Lord reigns. And here we have that exact phrase for the very first time in the book explicitly in verse 1 of Psalm 93. The Lord reigns. He's robed in majesty. And that expression, the Lord reigns, will come up again and again now as we work through the fourth book of the Psalms. And you need to hear that. And I need to hear that. Three simple words. The Lord reigns. You don't. I don't. World leaders don't reign. School bullies don't reign. Difficult relatives don't reign. The internet doesn't reign. Godlessness doesn't reign. Satan doesn't reign. Tragedy and confusion, they don't reign. The Lord reigns. Right? The Lord reigns. If you get no other truth out of this morning, that's the truth to ground you for now and forever. The Lord reigns reigns and he alone how do you know well the psalm tells us the lord reigns he is robed in majesty robed in majesty armed with strength verse one if you were to go out later have tea and coffee and uh, little feet pitter patter out of the crash okay just imagine that a small person comes out of the crash and they're wearing a robe they found it in the dressing up. What would you say to them? I'd probably say, depending on whether it was a boy or a girl, I'd say, oh, a, a princess. Lovely. Or I'd say, wow, here comes a king. Wouldn't you? They're wearing a robe. Because it identifies you as royal. And that's what this is happening in, in the psalm. The Lord reigns. He is robed. He is robed. That means he has the emblems of royalty. He is the obvious monarch. What's he robed with? Not simply the symbols or the emblems of majesty like a queen might have a crown placed upon her head at her coronation. No, he's not robed with that kind of symbol, but rather with majesty itself. That's his garb. You see, he's robed in majesty. Not in something that points towards it, but in majesty itself. Eternal splendour, unassailable strength are his clothing, are his battle dress, if you like. He's robed in majesty, armed or belted up, girded with strength. That's what he wears. It marks him off as the one who reigns. And then here comes the point. You've got this. Here comes the point of the first bit of the psalm. Verse 1 continues, Indeed, the world is established firm and secure. Now that's where the psalmist wants to get you once he's told you that the Lord reigns. If the Lord reigns, then, consequence, the world is established firm and secure. In other words, God's sovereignty makes the world stable. One follows on from the other. Now, as soon as you say that, or even as you read that verse, the world is established, firm and secure, 
you think, hold on a minute, which world are we talking about? Not the world I live in. <laughs> the world is firm, secure. Literally, in Hebrew, it's the world is not shaken, cannot be shaken. <laughs> well, that seems like a kind of different world to the world we're in right now, doesn't it? Seems very much shakeable. And yet, here's God's word saying, no, because the Lord reigns, the world's established, it's firm and it's secure, it can't be shaken. So, what's going on? Well, you've got to read on into the next verse, where he says, using the same language, Lord, your throne was established long ago. You're from all eternity. Okay, so the world was established because God's throne is established. Those two things tie together. In other words, yes, of course, it's true to say that plenty happens in the world that seems to shake it from our perspective. Even this psalm will affirm that in the next few verses. We'll come to that. But from God's perspective, now we're talking about something very different. From God's perspective, which is the perspective that matters for a Christian, the world is not, in fact, hurtling from one crisis to another, from one out-of-control thing to another. No, the world is operating continually according to God's <coughs> rule. God's throne is established and the world is established according to his decrees that emanate from that throne. You know, even the certainty of the laws of nature ought to remind us of this. Just go to any seaside town in the UK and look up the tide times. You ever done that? You, you go to the, the seaside and you want to see what time is the tide going to be in or out? Because we want to go to the beach, we don't want to be there when the, the tide's right up at the seawall. So you go and you look up the tide times, and I can guarantee you, they will not be out by a minute. If they say it's going to be low tide at 2.35, it will be low tide at 2.35 on the dot. Why? Because the world is established. God has set into the fabric of our globe patterns that don't change. That's how science can be done. That's how oceanographers work out when the tide is going to be up and when it's going to be down. That's why you can go to an astronomer and they'll tell you, ah, the next solar eclipse, the next time the moon is going to pass in front of the sun is going to be at this time and the best place to see it is from that location. And it's absolutely right. They won't be, they won't be wrong because you can depend upon the fixed order of things that God has set into our world. The world is established. The laws of nature teach us that. And once we figure that out, we realise that actually God does have complete sovereignty over everything that happens, even when it appears to us from world events and the wickedness of humanity against humanity and in rebellion against God, that seems to shake that sense of security and firmness. No, we need to remember what God says about this. His throne was established from long ago. He is from eternity. And our lives are spent discovering all the ways in which that will always prove to be true. When we look back in hindsight, we always see, oh yes, God was working out his purpose. It is God's sovereignty that makes the world stable. But that, of course, is not to say, as we've been getting at, that nothing ever goes wrong in the world, or we never are perplexed by events, either on a ground scale or in our own lives and so that's why we need to see the next thing yes God's sovereignty makes the world stable but secondly God's strength makes all threats small God's strength makes all threats small so we've got to get to the threats because there are threats there are things which disturb the peace of our world and your life no doubt this apparently established order in the world, from our point of view, can easily be disrupted. Look at verse 3. The psalmist looks at those same oceans which we could so depend upon, and he's saying, hold on a minute, they are rising up and they are threatening me. The seas have lifted up, Lord. They've lifted up their voice, lifted up their pounding waves. Now, we live on an island, and we're kind of maybe a bit used to the sea and most of you probably have been to the sea you've probably been to the sea on a stormy day and you've seen it pounding its waves against uh, the shore but Israelites didn't like the sea at all they didn't go on holidays to the beach okay 
Israelites were not a seafaring nation. Often threats came from across the sea, so much so that um, the sea can be used as a, a, a picture of foreign nations invading the country, or just can be used on its own terms as something frightening and disruptive and disturbing. The life on the open waves that many people today might see as a great adventure, even many people in Israel's day, that was not a life that appealed to people in that nation. And to so to speak of seas and pounding waves is for the psalmist to, to speak of threat and uncertainty and danger and possibly invasion. But something else to understand is that the pounding of the sea was, of course, at that time, basically the most powerful force known to man. There wasn't anything more powerful than that. Let's remember, we're, we're, we're reading this psalm, which was written maybe a thousand years before Christ. We're in a period of history way before the development of modern weapons or industrial power. So to stand there at the edge of the sea in the middle of a storm was literally, at that time, to witness the most powerful thing on the planet. There was no power greater than that. And even today, if you go to Whitby or you go to Bridlington or some other coastal town where the waves come right up to the seafront during the storms and you were to stand there, even on a reasonably windy day, you can understand, can't you, how dangerous such power has the potential to be? I wouldn't like to be thrown into the sea next to the pier at Whitby or somewhere like that, would you, if it was really stormy? Because it's powerful, more powerful than you or I. So, not just on a mildly windy day, but when the psalmist says the seas have lifted up their voice, they're pounding waves, they're thundering the great waters, that, that to him, that's the equivalent of saying Putin has pressed the button and everything's going to be destroyed. That's his outlook. That's the most powerful thing he can imagine. But what is so important to see here is that though he's saying, I'm just imagining the most powerful force known to man, what he's doing by introducing that idea is he's actually cutting that statement right down to science. Because you see where he says, the seas have lifted up their voice, verse 3. But verse 4 is the point, mightier than the thunder of the great waters, mightier than the breakers of the sea, the Lord on high is mighty. You see? So he's saying, here's the most powerful thing you can imagine. Just use your imagination for what it might mean today. The most powerful force. Nothing. Nothing compared to the power of the Lord. Mightier. And all of that, the Lord on high is mighty. God's strength makes all threats small. It doesn't mean that they won't seem big to us. That's not the point. The point is that they are so small to God. Let's just remember this, brothers and sisters. Please, let's remember this at the moment. There is not a single head of state in the world alive today who will be in charge of their country in 50 years' time. Kim Jong-un will be in a coffin when my daughters are drawing their pension. Let's just get that clear, shall we? Let's get clear that the greatest leaders of the world today are just a breath of wind before the Almighty. The turnover in world leadership is 100%. But the Lord of heaven and earth will still be in charge when they are long gone. Let us just have that sink down into our souls. Mightier than the floods. Mightier than invasion. Mightier than bombs. Mightier than COVID. Mightier than cancer. Mightier than loneliness. Mightier than grief. Mightier than any other power in the universe. Neither life nor death, nor angels nor demons, nor any other power in all creation 
will be able to separate us from the love of God that's in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. All the waves will lift up their voice at some point. You can be sure of that. The question is, when they do, not if, but when they do, will you have already got clear in your mind and your heart their power relative to the strength of the risen Saviour? That's what you've got to get clear. Whose power is greater? Decide it now before the trouble comes so that when it does you can say, I'm standing on the rock, the Lord Jesus Christ. I love this at Whitby Pier. Some of you will have seen this. Whitby, North Yorkshire coast, of course. If you walk down the pier, go, go over the side. I remember going as a kid and being terrified because you can see the sea through the planks. But then you get a bit further on, and there's, it's, it's kind of concrete at that point, and you, and you walk further out, further out, and the sea's all around you then. You get to the, there's the lighthouse, isn't there? At the end of the pier. And if you see the lighthouse in, in, in storms, you see the waves absolutely crashing around it. Okay. But someone, I don't know who, I don't know who had permission or whatever, but someone, if you go to that lighthouse, you'll see there's a, there's a plaque, and it's about that big. It's, it's not very big. But on that lighthouse on Whitby Pier, are written these words, mightier than the thunder of the great waters. Mightier than the breakers of the sea. The Lord on high is mighty. Someone's put it up there where the waves break around. And then they've not just quoted the verse, they put it underneath. They said, God is always greater than all of our troubles. Who put it there? I don't know. But I know they're right. Do you? Yeah. Great. They're right, aren't they? God's strength makes all threats small. Doesn't remove threats, but it puts them in perspective. Okay? We've seen God's sovereignty makes the world stable. God's strength makes all threats small. Thirdly, God's statutes make his people secure. God's statutes make his people secure. The last verse of the psalm. The psalmist, at first glance, seems to go off at a bit of a tangent, a bit of a different direction. Suddenly he's not talking about majesty and the seas and the Lord on high being mighty. He says, verse 5, Your statutes, Lord, stand firm. Holiness adorns your house for endless days. You think, well, hold on a minute. You want to statutes, holiness, God's house? But actually it's all on very much the same theme. Because the question is, okay, how do we know that God's sovereignty makes the world stable? How do we know, where do we learn that God's strength makes all threats small. Well, we learn it from his statutes, from his word, from his self-revelation. We don't guess. We don't even look at the world around and say, hmm, this looks like it's in control, because it doesn't, does it? We've got to go to the word. We've got to listen to what God says about his word and our lives. And when we do that, we realise, ah, your statutes, Lord, they're firm. I can trust what you say about your world and my life. That is just as unassailable as his majesty itself. Your statutes, Lord, stand firm. Can't change what God has said because what he said is truth, unchanging. So we don't rely upon hunches when we come to God trusting him for our lives. We read his lips. We say, I want to listen to what you say, Lord. I come back to the word when I'm feeling troubled and anxious. I come back to your word. Your statutes, Lord, stand firm. His statutes, I'm saying, make his people secure. Because God doesn't make mistakes. God doesn't commit atrocities. God doesn't get things wrong or make regrettable decisions. Never, never, never. Because holiness, we're told, adorns his house for endless days. He's holy in all his ways. Never gets anything wrong. 
always completely trustworthy, pure and good. Holiness adorns your house for endless days. Well, let's just pause. What is your house? What is God's house? Well, obviously the place where he lives. Well, all right, that's like everywhere, isn't it? Well, no, the psalmist is particularly thinking of the place where God has specially chosen to dwell on earth. At that time, the temple. Maybe the tabernacle is written before the temple was built. Well, let's go with the temple for now. Holiness adorns the temple. So I can go there if I'm in Israel. I can say that's where God is. And that shows me the holiness. Because it's beautiful. It's sacred. and It's set apart. But when you get into the New Testament, you start to understand that the temple that was made of stone and wood and gold was not actually the temple at all. Not the true temple. Now the true house of the Lord was, and always shall be, a person. The greatest and most dependable and most holy person who was ever to live. The person of the Lord Jesus Christ, who by his own admission was the true temple of the Lord from his own lips. Look it up in John chapter 2 if you want. So you want to see the holiness and goodness and beauty and trustworthiness of God in all the storms of life? What do you do? You look at the temple. His name is Jesus. You look at that temple being destroyed, torn down by forces apparently too strong for him as he is hammered to a Roman cross. And then you look at him raising that temple up three days later, saying, no one, but no one could take my life from me. I lay it down on my own accord and I take it up again on my own accord. He has the authority to lay it down and he did it for us sinners who deserve to be put out of God's sight forever. And he said, I'll do that so they can be forgiven. I have authority to lay it down, and do you know what? I have authority to take it up again. And when you see that, you see that Jesus is the Lord of Psalm 93. And you see that the rulers of the earth, to a man and to a woman, are currently obeying his sovereign will, whether they know it or not. And you see that he is working out his purpose to bring the nations into his family and to save an innumerable company of people for his glory and for their good forever and ever. And you see that he will bring the wicked to justice. And you see that he shall save his people by grace. And you will bow down one day before him. And my prayer is, of course, you'll bow down in worship and love and thanks now. Not be forced to bow down in fear and terror when he comes again. The mighty Lord who is robed in majesty and sovereignty over all things, he is beautifully, wonderfully, in fact, the very same man from Nazareth in northern Israel who shares your human nature even this morning and who knows what it's like to suffer and have people not like him and to have pain and difficulty and temptation and mockery and everything else that comes with life in a fallen world. He knows. There is a man on the throne of the universe this morning. And holiness adorns him for endless days. And it will adorn all those who put their trust in him. So, do you want to live a life free of anxiety and full of stability when the seas are lifting up their pounding waves? How do you do that? You let the sovereignty of Jesus be the stability of your life. Let's pray together. What else is there to do but worship you, Sovereign Lord Jesus, the Eternal One who became man, lived and died for us, rebels and sinners, raised us with him from the grave to new life to praise you to worship you and to live for you in our day in our age when so much around us seems to fall apart we thank you that we can rest on your sovereignty and pray you'd help us to do so we ask in your own sweet precious powerful name amen amen